man, it is so good to be up here. It is so uh, exciting to be back uh, in the pulpit. I have to start by saying thank you. As our family has transitioned from three to four, we have been so blessed by you. Uh, You have prayed for us. You have brought us meals. You have given us gifts. uh, You have called us. You have checked in on us. And we are just so thankful for you. So thank you. I also want to say that I love you. And I love you because you love the truth. I love you because you love the church. And I love you because you love Jesus. And you make it your goal to be like Jesus. And I love that about you. One of the best things about Jesus, in my opinion, is that Jesus was a bridge builder. Jesus found ways to connect with others with the purpose of bridging mankind back to God. It was his mission that he was set out to be a bridge builder. And as Christians who strive to be like Jesus, we also should set out to be bridge builders to help connect mankind back to God. And one of the ways we can do that is by utilizing the culture that we are all surrounded by. We are all a bunch of people who come from different backgrounds, but something that we all have in common is that we are all surrounded by culture. And depending on your age, depending on where you live, depending where you work, depending on really a lot of different things, the culture that you are surrounded by might look different than the people that are in this room with you. And if we want to be effective bridge builders, we need to understand how to utilize the cultures that we are surrounded by and find ways to connect with others with the intention of bridging them back to God. And although we have evolved in many areas of life uh, and technology and religion and, and social institutions, this idea of engaging with our culture and not ignoring it and being bridge builders is not a new concept that we are having to try to invent for the the growth and the success of the 21st century church. And so I want to start by actually taking a look at our culture a little bit. I don't think it comes to anyone as a surprise that we live in an, an extremely secular society. And I think the numbers back that up. In a poll taken in 2022, 63% of people in the United States claim to be Christians. And you can look at that number from a pessimistic point of view and say, only 63% of people are Christians? Or you can look at it from an optimistic point of view. Wow, 63% of people in the United States are Christians. As I was doing this study, there was a group of people that I have never heard of until I was doing this that I wanted to bring to your attention. It's a group called the nuns, and we're not talking about the people and the the black and the white uh, dresses. Uh, This group of people, the nuns, is a people who don't identify with any sort of religious background. They may not necessarily be hostile to Christianity, they just don't associate themselves or identify with anything. Uh, The growth of the nuns in American society has been dramatic. In 1972, just 5% of Americans claimed no religion in the general social survey. However, in 2018, that number rose to 23.7%. And in the survey taken last year in 2022, the religious nuns, there are 29% of people who claim to have no affiliation with any sort of religion. Now, to put that in perspective, that means Christians only outnumber religious nuns by a little more than two to one. Every indication is that the nuns will be the largest religious group in the United States in the next decade. Now, when we hear that statistic, I think there are only two proper responses to it. Number one, we can find ourselves discouraged and disappointed and decide that we can't do anything about it, so we just accept the trends and say that Christianity is about to be outnumbered, it's on its way out. Or, we can recognize that there's some work to do. And recognize that we are called to be bridge builders, but not only be bridge builders, also be trend turners. And so that's what I want to talk about together this morning, 
is I want us to consider how we can be bridge builders through culture. So if you have your Bibles, let's open together to Acts chapter 17. And we are going to look at verses 16 through 31, as David read for us. Thank you for reading that extremely long passage. I appreciate you doing that for me. And as you're turning to Acts 17, I I want to set up the scene a little bit for us. At the beginning of the chapter, Paul and Silas are in Thessalonica. And they are there in the synagogue reasoning with the people, as was Paul's custom to do, as verse 2 tells us. And they're telling about the good news of Jesus. The group of Jews that are in Thessalonica don't like that message, so they kick Paul and Silas out. They make their way to Berea, and they're doing the same thing. They're reasoning in the synagogues. And then everything's actually going well there until the group from Thessalonica comes and stirs things up, which sends Paul to Athens. But this time it's a little different because Paul does not have Silas with him. Paul is actually by himself in this place of Athens. Now Athens was an incredible place. Athens was a place of great history. Famous historians, famous philosophers, artists, and sculptors once called Athens home. In in Paul's day, although the, the golden age of Athens had come and gone, it was still a beautiful influential and intellectual city, but it definitely had its flaws. And where we're going to spend our time together in this sermon is what we commonly refer to as the Sermon on Mars Hill. And what I want us to think about as we look at Paul's Sermon on Mars Hill, as we look at this section of scripture, is I want us to consider a few things that we see Paul do as he set out to be a bridge builder himself. We're first going to look at what Paul observed in the city of Athens. Then we're going to look at how Paul reacted based on what he observed in the city. And then we're going to look at what Paul preached to these people, how he responded with his words to all that he observed. So with that being said, let's first look at Paul's observation in verse 16. It says, now while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked. That word provoked is this idea that he was distressed. He he was deeply troubled. We might say in our lingo, Paul was fired up. And, And whether it was because he was angry or he was grieving or he had a desire to convert them and save their souls, seeing this city fired him up. It provoked him. Why? Because the city was full of idols. Now, there is no other place in the New Testament that is described the way this place is. And that's because practically every building in Athens had some sort of connection to one of the ancient Greek gods. I believe if we were to be able to time travel back to the city of Athens and we found ourselves standing in the middle of the city, we would look around and just be so impressed Uh, We would see the architecture and the learning and the philosophy. We might look around and be so impressed, but Paul was not impressed. Paul was distressed. And it was said, you know, as the city of Athens, it was said that it would be easier to find a God than it would would be to find a man. I mean, this was a city that was wholly given to idolatry. So when Paul enters into Athens, his observation of the culture is that this is a culture who did not fear God. And that affected him. It it provoked him. And so now I want to ask us, when we look out at the different cultures that we are surrounded by, when we observe our culture, what do we see? And how do we feel when we see what we see? Now, I, I would argue that we don't see these big images erected to these ancient Greek gods. The only thing I can think about is Bucky's in, in Texas, the, the giant beaver god that everyone loves so much. Well, we don't see that anymore. But I do not think that that means that we are not a culture that is wholly given to idolatry. Our culture has done an incredible job, and I say that very loosely, of taking normal, ordinary, everyday things and turning them into idols. Our phones, social media, food, sports, technology, so many ordinary things that our culture has taken and turned them into gods. I I would define a modern day idol as something that you love, prioritize, identify with, 
or look to for need of fulfillment outside of God. Now, I, I, I don't want us to be mistaken. Those things are not inherently evil. Your iPhone in your pocket is not inherently evil. You being good at sports and enjoying sports and buying season tickets to OU football is not inherently evil. But we have to be so careful that those things do not become our God. But let's be honest. Have we not seen those things become God to too many people? Have we not seen too many people fall into idolatry that are self-proclaimed Christians? Just because we are Christians does not mean that we are immune to idolatry. See, the more we live in our culture, the more we live in our society, the more possible it is for us to just get used to living within a culture that is wholly given to it. And we think, uh, you know, what, what can we actually do about it? And so those things just become normal to us and they don't stir us up anymore. But that was not the case with Paul. The more he encountered the culture, the more he wanted to do something about it. Because I, I believe that he thinks this saying to be true. The more comfortable we get with idolatry, the more likely we probably are to fall into idolatry. And we must guard ourselves from that. And when we get to the end of our lesson, we'll talk about some practical things we can do as we observe the idolatry in our culture. So there's Paul's observation, but now let's consider Paul's reaction. How how does Paul react after he observes all that he's observed in Athens with the mindset of being a bridge builder? Number 1, Paul took the time to examine the culture. When you look at verse, 20, uh, verse 16, as he saw the city was full of idols. Verse 23, for as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship. This seeing word, this idea of observed is to examine something carefully. To watch something with sustained attention. I think about the fisherman observing his line out in the water, watching for any sort of movement. I think about the baker carefully observing the cake in the oven, ensuring it's rising properly and baking appropriately. Paul took the time to examine the culture, to to observe the culture that he found himself in. I find it important that Paul, as he comes into the city, doesn't instantly blast them once he sees the immense idolatry in this place. He first examined it. He, he took the time to get a proper understanding of their culture. He, he took the time to gather all of the facts. If we want to be bridge builders, we need to take time to examine the culture and understand where people are coming from. Why do people do what they do? Why do they invest in what they invest in? Paul took time to examine the culture. The next thing we see Paul do is that he engaged with them. If you look at verse 17, it says, So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. See, the synagogue was the place of assembly. He found himself conversing and discussing with the Jews and the people who fear God. And if I were to guess, this is probably the place where Paul felt the most comfortable. Uh, This is the place where we see him doing this most often. Uh, Chapter 17, verse 1, he's doing this in Thessalonica. Verse 2 tells us it was his custom to do this there. You see chapter 17 uh, when he moves to Berea. You see it here. You see it in chapter 18, verse 4 as he's in Corinth. This was a good place where common people uh, or people of common faith would gather and it seemed to be a great opportunity for Paul to have religious conversations in this place. And when I think about us, where is it that we find ourselves being the most comfortable having religious conversations? It's right here, right? Because we're comfortable here. We're with people who have common faith, who generally want to be here. So we have those conversations here. But notice Paul does not just stay in the synagogue. He also went into the marketplace. Church, if we want to be bridge builders, sometimes we have to go into unfamiliar places. Sometimes we have to go places where we are not comfortable. And I know I'm guilty of this mindset, 
But I'm afraid too often what we do, instead of saying, Lord, here am I, send me, we say, Lord, here we are, bring them to us. And Paul understood that he could not build bridges by just staying in the synagogue, and that led him to the marketplace. Now, the marketplace was the center of life. It wasn't just a place for goods. I don't want you to think Walmart when you hear marketplace. This was not just a place for goods. It was a place for ideas. It was a place where conversations happened. And so I think, where is our marketplace today? Where do we go to have conversations with people? And really, it's anywhere you go. It's, it's at Jimmy's Egg on Tuesdays. It's, it's where you go get your coffee. It's in the bleachers at your kid's game. It's in the break room at work. It's on a fishing boat. It's on Twitter. It's on Facebook. It's on Instagram. It's on social media platforms. The message that, that Paul sends to us is we need to be able to engage people in whatever setting we find ourselves in. You can be a bridge builder wherever you find yourself. You can be a bridge builder at Jimmy's Egg on Tuesday mornings. Are there not people at Jimmy's Egg or Boomerang or Sherry's Diner that are not Christians in that building that you're in? Are there not Christians, are there not non-Christians in the bleachers at your games that you go to? Are there not non-Christians where you go get your hair cut? Are there not non-Christians where you go drink your coffee? We need to be able to engage people in whatever those settings we find ourselves in. Number three, Paul found common ground, and he started where they were. When Paul begins his initial address to this people, he says in verse 22, As I was observing what you do around here, I observe that you are very religious. Now, there, there was common ground, at least in this broad spectrum, that him and them were both religious. And notice that's where he started his address. Now, I want to step on my own toes a little bit. I want to step on our toes and make this very practical. What, what might this look like in common day? Do we not like to bash those people who come to church two times a year? Let's be honest. Our, our, Christ, our, our Easter Christians and our Christmas Christians. What if instead of making fun of them, we capitalize on the fact that they were here? You know, we love to say, well, we don't really know if this was when Jesus was resurrected. Sure. And we say, we don't really know if this was Jesus' birthday. But church, a bridge builder will capitalize on the fact that those people are here. And we will not make them feel guilty or bad for being here, even if they only show up two times a year. Sure, sure they might not be as religious as us, but they're here. And we can start there, and we can capitalize on the fact that they're here. Now, when it comes to today's Christian and today's skeptic, there is no, uh, there is, there is no question that we are miles apart on fundamental basic principles. But I would argue that no matter who we engage with today, there will always be something that we have in common. Maybe it's the fact that you're both OU fans. Maybe it's that you're both into running. Maybe it's that you're both into coffee. Maybe it's that you're both into a certain genre of book. Notice in Paul's message and his preaching, he quotes from two Greek poets that were just as pagan as the philosophers that he was talking to were. But what those poets said, even though they weren't Christians, even though they weren't people for God, he could use what they said to get his message across effectively because what they said were general statements of truth. And he used those general statements of truth and he turned them to his advantage to point them to God. I encourage you to find common ground and start there. The next thing I notice about Paul and his time in Athens is trying to be a bridge builder is that he ignored insults. When you look at verse 18, it says some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. And some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Now that word babbler literally means a seed picker. It meant to describe a bird hopping around from place to place, gathering seed from here and gathering seed from here. When used for people, it's talking about a person who has hopped around and picked up a little grain of knowledge here, a little grain of knowledge here, a little grain of knowledge here, and, and, and was spitting out what he thought he knew, 
but he didn't know nearly as much as he thought he knew. The bottom line, these people were calling Paul stupid or uneducated. But notice how at any point he never addresses what was said about himself. See, Paul isn't a stupid man and he knew he wasn't a stupid man. Paul was not an uneducated man, and he knew he was not an uneducated man. He did the thing that he knew what was best for dealing with insults, and it was that he ignored them and he didn't say a thing about them. You know, sometimes I'm afraid we can get so focused on addressing the insults that are thrown our way, that, and we try to win an argument, and we forget what we're really trying to do is win their soul. When trying to be a bridge builder, you may be insulted. And when you do, ignore them. And certainly don't be the one to initiate insults. I know that when we get behind our screens, we feel big. We feel like we can say whatever we want to say. But I encourage you to flee from that. I encourage you to bring gentleness and seasoned speech. And remember what's important. We're trying to win their soul for Jesus. The final thing that I see Paul do is he transitioned to differences that they had. When you look at verse 23, Paul didn't simply stay in the area of where they were comfortable. He goes on to bring up the truth that there is only one God. And this one God is far greater than any idol that was in the city of Athens. He was greater than all of the idols in Athens put together. He was able to transition to the differences they had. See, those conversations that we have at breakfast, those conversations... And the bleachers, those conversations with the non-Christians that, that you engage with, I encourage you to not just talk about sports, to not just talk about your family, to not just talk about politics. Take the opportunity to share your faith and to discuss with them about Jesus and about your faith and your walk with them. Ask for courage to transition that conversation to the differences that you most likely know are there with that person in order to win their soul over to Jesus. Now that's Paul's reactions. Now let's consider Paul's preaching in verses 24 through 31. What I love about Paul's preaching is that everything he has to say to them is completely relevant based on what he observed about their culture. Everything he's going to say to them revolves around this one image that he found that was labeled to the unknown God. And what he says, what therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. And this is what Paul proclaims to them. He proclaims to them the greatness of God in verse 24. How he is creator, how he is Lord, how he is the master and the maker of heaven and earth. How God does not dwell in temples made by human hands because human hands could never compare, could never create who and what God is. He proclaims to them the goodness of God in verse 25, how he is provider, how he is responsible for giving everything to everybody. As the psalmist writes, he causes the sun to rise on the just and the unjust. He causes the rain to fall on those who are good and those who are evil. He is a good God. He proclaims to them the government of God in verses 25 through 29, how he is ruler, how he is sovereign, He created every person and every being and every nation. It is him who determines the rise and their fall. And he created all of us to seek him. And in this process of seeking him, the motivation is that he is not far, that he is within your grasp and he wants you to find him because he wants to be your father, because he wants you to be his child. And as a child understands, there is no greater blessing than being a child of God. That there is no gold or silver or anything in this world that compares to God. There's nothing that is comparable to being a child of God. And then he says, I want to tell you about the grace of God. In verse 30 and 31. How he is Savior. And what Paul was encouraging the people to do in Athens is the same thing that we are challenged to do today. And it's to surrender all of your idols and all of your ideologies to Jesus. And that's what we do every week when we come together on Sundays. As we come here, we take the bread and the cup 
We sing these songs, we pray these prayers, we admonish each other, and we encourage each other to surrender all of our idols and ideologies to Jesus. Because as Paul says, there is coming a day where Jesus will judge us all. And every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess him as Lord. And we can confirm that because he raised Jesus from the dead, and he wants to be your Savior. I want us to consider how the people responded to Paul's preaching. Because I think that's essential for us to notice as we think about ourselves wanting to be bridge builders. How might the people respond? Let's look at verses 32 through 34. Now when they heard the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. But others said, we will hear you again about this. So Paul went out from their midst. But some men joined him and believed, among whom also were Dionysius the Areopagite and a woman named Damaris and others with them. And did you hear how confidently I said those names? Listen, as we try to be bridge builders, there are going to be some people who listen to what we're saying and want to stick around and hear more. And that's great. There may be some people, as we preach what we preach, who are convicted and and who make Jesus the Lord of their lives. How amazing would that be? But there are also going to be people that when they listen to what we're saying, they're going to mock, they're going to sneer, and they're going to insult and think you're stupid. But church, let me encourage you, regardless of how people respond, keep trying to build bridges. See, Paul devoted himself to being a bridge builder. Jesus devoted himself to being a bridge builder. And I hope and I pray that you will make the same devotion as well. As we end, I want to get extremely practical and applicable. You might ask, what can I do on a practical level, on an everyday level? What can I do to be a bridge builder? Specifically, what can I do to be a bridge builder through the culture that I am surrounded by? I want to leave you with just three things based off what we've talked about together so far. Number one, be uncomfortable with idolatry. And help others find what they're looking for. My friends, when people are caught up in their phones, and when their phone becomes their God, or or when sports become their God, or technology, or food, or something that is not God becomes their God, it's because they're seeking something bigger than themselves. They're, They're seeking fulfillment. They're seeking worth. They're seeking knowledge. They're seeking something. And they think that the answers are found in those things. But church, do we not have a God that offers and gives infinite fulfillment? Do we not have a God that provides infinite and eternal worth? Do we not have a God that literally wants us to ask him for his wisdom and promises that he will give that wisdom to us? See, they're searching for something. That's why they get caught up in it. They're looking for something bigger than themselves. And we have something bigger than themselves that we can tell them about. I encourage you to start telling people about what they're actually looking for. Number two. Look for opportunities to engage. Even in as secular of a culture as ancient Athens was, there were honest hearts there. In the midst of all of those idols lining every street and temples all over the place to false deities, so much of that was just wrapped up in the daily culture of Athens, yet there were still honest hearts that were open to the truth. And Paul sought that out. And I would argue that there are still honest hearts today in our increasingly secular culture. And may God be gracious enough to open our eyes to those people. Make the decision to engage with the people that you come in contact with. Make the decision to ask that waitress if she knows God. Make that decision to shift those conversations you have to spiritual conversations 
Say a prayer before you do it. Ask God, God, you know I'm nervous right now. Maybe, God, you know I've never done this before. Give me bravery. Give me courage. Give me strength. Let what I'm about to say to this person bring truth into their life. May you interact with this conversation and please touch the heart of this person I'm about to talk to. Look for opportunities to engage and shift those conversations to where you know there are probably some differences there with the intention of bridging that person back to God. And number three, and I think most importantly, if we want to be a bridge builder, we must first live a life that has been transformed by the gospel. Live out your Christian worldview in your workplace, in your home, at your kids' games, at coffee, on social media. Demonstrate love and compassion uh, to all of those that you come in contact with, treating them with kindness and empathy and respect, regardless of their background or their beliefs. Be a good person. Because I, I believe there is nothing more compelling when trying to build bridges than for someone to look at us and see that we have first been transformed by the Spirit. And so I encourage you to continue to grow in your faith, uh, to continue to deepen your relationship with God, to continue reflecting his love and light to the world that's around you. Because I promise you, others will notice that. Because the life that Jesus calls us to is countercultural. And when you live a countercultural life, people notice that and people will ask you why you live the way you live and you have an opportunity to tell them about the God that you love and the God that you serve. I recognize that there are some people here this morning who have not been bridged back to God. That you find yourself in a state that, that you are separate from God that you were excluded from the grace of God and you stand unclean before his throne this morning. Isaiah 59.2, your iniquities have separated you from God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. But here's the good news. Jesus was a bridge builder. And he took your place on the cross and he rose from the dead with the hope of connecting you back to God. And you can do that this morning by confessing of your sins and devoting your life to him and making the decision to be forgiven uh, by, by being baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. Maybe you're here this morning and you want to make the devotion to being a bridge builder. Maybe you just need some encouragement. Maybe you need some strength from your fellow brothers and sisters here. Maybe you need help with something going on in your life and you need prayers, you need hugs. If there's anything that we can do for you this morning, especially to help you be a better bridge builder, we want to do that right now while together we stand and sing.